Uh, so I am delighted to introduce our next speakers. I'm Kathy Weeks from the Program in Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies. And um, as I said, I'm delighted to introduce our next speakers. Dr. Nat Raha is a poet, artist, teacher, and scholar who works at the intersection of feminist, trans, queer, and Marxist studies. Dr. Ma Dr. Micah Vanderdrift is a teacher, artist, and philosopher whose scholarship draws on ethics, cultural theory, and trans studies. Those lists are only, I assure you, very partial and don't even begin to do justice to the wonderfully expansive range of their knowledges and interests. Rather than list all of their accomplishments and publications, I'd like to say something instead about why I'm so happy they're here today. Um, and it could be summarized or encapsulated in a single term, transfeminism. And part of me wants to just say, my work is done here, enjoy the talk. Um, but I'm going to elaborate just a little bit on some of the specifics of their individual and joint scholarship on this theme that I found so compelling. One of these is Nat Raha's provocative argument in the terrific volume, Transgender Marxism, that the labors engaged in on the part of subordinated groups, particularly trans and queer people, through which they struggle to fashion livable identities in supportive communities, should be included in Marxist feminist theories as a mode of socially reproductive labor alongside other forms of socially sustaining care labor. Another is Micah Vanderdrift's enticing vision expressed in a printed conversation with Netta Genova of a trans politics of care committed to making relations by way of the complex ethical skill set of listening, collaboration, and mutual aid. But what I'm most excited about in this moment is their co-authored work, um, a book-length contribution to which is forthcoming from Pluto Press with the title, Trans Femme Futures and Abolitionist Ethics for Trans Feminist Worlds. A chapter they published titled, Radical Feminism, Trans as Anti-Static Ethics Escaping Neoliberal Encapsulation can give us a sense of the power of this work, which I would characterize as radical, trans-feminist, and political, and I wanna define how I see each of those terms. I understand the radical dimension of this as a counter-discourse to trans-liberalism's model of add and stir inclusion without transformation. The trans here is approached not in terms of categories of being, but as transit, becoming, and above all, as relationality. As a consequence, the politics they then embrace is rigorously and deeply coalitional. The we of the project they describe in the chapter, they describe as, quote, the precarious and poor, trans and queer people, feminized, although sometimes femme, of various genders, abilities, and embodiments, brown, white, and black, with different histories of migration, and with bodies that have necessarily enacted change, end quote. This means that as they approach it, radical transfeminism is a collective political and epistemological project that refuses the politics of purity with its deeply judgy, mercilessly punishing, and I should add, politically vacuous division between the supposedly guilty and the innocent. What I think they offer instead is a powerful theory and practice that aspires to a capacious, tenacious, lively, and liberatory understanding of collective political solidarity. The title of their talk today is, It Takes a Nation of Managers to Hold Us Back. <laughs> there's a lot of resonances with Roderick Ferguson's talk already. Um, and there's a colon, transfeminism, Transliberalism and the Currents of Empire. Please join me in welcoming Nat Raha and Micah Vanderdrift. Thanks for, yeah, thanks for everyone who's helped to arrive here. I'm just going to dive in. We're going to talk for about an hour and we'll try and go at a pace that is helpful so that you can listen. And um, we're presenting work from this book project and there's kind of lots of threads through other subjects and elements that are kind of in this work um, that we can also kind of pull and bring out. Okay. Mm. 
Our transfeminism emerges out of practices of collectivity oriented towards support and care and forms of solidarity oriented towards social and material transformation. This ethics is grounded in recognizing and encouraging agency, building the understanding and conditions whereby we can grow our collective actions. This also entails understanding our situation within and relations with the institutions and bureaucracy that frame life under neoliberal racial patriarchal capitalism. We develop an analysis of the dynamics of such institutions, understanding their violences from our situated and sold body minds. And this is to like refuse the separation of the mind and the body and the soul. <clears throat> In encounters to such contexts, collectives provide a means or spaces to manifest alternatives of support, survival and nourishing worlds, while challenging and dismantling the separability of white supremacist states and cultural logics. In this talk, we look at two forms of patriarchy, hard patriarchy and soft patriarchy. The first is a patriarchy running on direct violence and exclusion, for instance, in the pronouncements of a white supremacist state to, to degrade and control bodily autonomy. And the second is a humanizing patriarchy, which contrasts itself with such directly aggressive forms, while offering inclusion as the remedy against the exclusions pronounced by hard patriarchy. We argue that inclusion keeps the violence of institutions as such out of sight, and stages a foundational innocence as basis for this inclusion. We argue that the operation of bureaucratic frameworks ground itself in a claim to innocence, which we will contrast with our eager claim to complicity in frictions, whether these are inside or with the norm or outside within our struggles of liberation. This leads to an ethics that practices refusal of a system that enacts dispossession and harm and mobilizes separability as a contemporary form of segregation. An ethics of care and solidarity can bring relief to the extremity of material struggles as a ground from which liberation can emerge. In addition, when we claim complicity, we do not only claim it vis-a-vis -vis norms, working to dismantle them and to divest their power and resources, but also as regards to the frictions that will inevitably emerge in liberation movements. Facing frictions between us enables us to work against separability. This first, this first section's on separability, specifically looking at through this UK context. So in the wake of the 2016 Brexit vote, the UK has seen an upsurge in racist and xenophobic sentiments and violence, and a readdress of the UK state and society from a decolonial and anti-colonial purview. Amid the intensification of totalitarian policies such as the hostile environment policy, the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act in 2022, the Nationality and Borders Act 2022, and the current Illegal Immigration Bill, which is brand new, um, and economic, social, and physical fallouts of austerity, it's been imposed since 2010, and the coronavirus pandemic, we're in a pivotal moment of reframing our understanding of Britain and its ongoing legacy and form as empire. Truths regarding how Britain is constituted, the proposed direction of the British nation state and the conservative slash far right nationalist vision for society have been thoroughly revealed through the hostile environment and the 2018 Windrush scandal. So brief explainer if you don't know about these. Um, the hostile environment policy um, is actively aimed at discouraging non-citizens, especially poor racialized minorities, from living in the UK. Uh, it entails introducing passport checks into many crucial aspects of everyday life, such as um, accessing housing, healthcare, welfare, employment, and education. There's restrictions on the right to reside in the UK, tying this to income, marital status, abiding by the law, um, which have also been reaffirmed, especially after Brexit. So the hostile environment adversely affects black, brown, migrant, and migrant people, including trans people, disproportionately. That's who it's targeting. Uh, but it also creates bureaucratic problems for some trans people with UK passports. And this policy, fed by xenophobic and anti-black ideology, is a key aspect of the architecture of a Western neoliberal state in the 21st century, a state committed to further bureaucratization and surveillance of public life. 
it's an active strategy of separability. Um, the Windrush scandal, which I briefly mentioned, is this scandal where um, the British government attempted to uh, demand proof from people who'd arrived, in the U arrived to work and live in the UK between the 1940s and the early 70s, which is this period where uh, ev everyone within the Commonwealth was, was automatically a British subject and there was freedom of movement to a degree. Um, and so there's a whole bureaucratic question about this that led to the deportation of around 75 people that shouldn't have been deported and a general atmosphere of hostility was kind of whipped up in this. Okay, so we understand these logics behind these policies, in, behind these policies to work to uphold white supremacy through forging divisions between people enclosed into norms and those actively marginalized by them. In, the, in a context of a white supremacist state, these dynamics of separability primarily work through race, the mobilization of racial grammars, xenophobia, and law, whereby cultural difference in Denise Ferreira de Silva's important formulation is mobilized to, quote, delimit the reach of the ethical notions of humanity. De Silva describes how separability emerges from the Kantian critique of reason, which limits the breadth of what is known through forms of intuition and the, through categories of understanding. This is in her essay. Uh, on difference without separability. <clears throat> in the current moment of bordering fortress Europe, cultural difference is deployed discursively and effectively to reproduce an other, be that the Muslim terrorist, the illegal immigrant, and differentially the asylum seeker and refugee, um, which sustains, this is a quote from De Silva, sustains statements of uncertainty that effectively undermine claims for protection under the human rights framework. In addition, separability mobilizes, quote, fear and uncertainty to give substance to its racial grammar, to, murder, to justify murderous violence and distress aimed at the other, alongside investment in security, borders, and deportations. This separability plays out structurally, so it's legal, it's economic, it's social, and cultural, from active disenfranchisement through the denial of legal rights to the bureaucratic and or interpersonal and or other forms of duress in the workplace or in society, to also to more casual everyday practices of social exclusion, of socially excluding people deemed different from norms. In short, separability manifests through these structures to pronounce who matters and who doesn't. These dynamics draw from, hist draw from histories of coloniality, including the categorical formulations of race, the impositions of what uh, Maria Lagones calls the modern the colonial slash modern gender system of sexual dimorphism rooted in whiteness, um, from colonization and dispossession, racial capitalism and slavery. Today, <clears throat> borders, policing, and various forms of incarceration, including immigration detention, play central roles in maintaining separation. The abstract idea of others leads to, a police, leads to policing of black and brown people, often stigmatized by Islamophobic sentiments, fleeing conflicts, seeking safety and opportunity, which includes the tens of thousands of people who've lost their lives at sea trying to reach Europe. In Brexit Britain, anti-blackness and xenophobia in service of white supremacy have trumped even economic logics, with Britain facing a labor shortage significant enough to affect the National Health Service and food supplies. While the Home Office creates new tiers, barriers, and divisions in and through the immigration system, producing a scarcity of workers, and this is to say that this, there's like a demand of labor that's typically been met by migrant workers that's like been really essential to the foundation of Britain, or the fabric of, British, of Britain as we know it. <clears throat> Brexit Britain has emphasized surveillance and friction for those marginalized by the, their legal status around migration and citizenship, while protecting national resources for white British people. Even black and brown Brits with UK passports are increasingly being thrown into question, in particular through the New Borders Act, which permits the Home Office to deprive one of their citizenship, alongside racialized policing. It's from this current context that Nadine Alanani encourages us to think of Britain, quote, as a contemporary colonial space, end quote, where British colonialism is an, quote, ongoing project sustained via the structure of law, end quote, and through historic and contemporary immigration laws in particular. Alanani, who's like one of a bunch of really amazing scholars kind of reconceptualizing Britain at this moment, there's Gigari Bhattacharya, uh, Kojo Koram, they're all really amazing writers. 
Al-Nani argues that Britain's immigration acts um, across the 20th and 21st centuries, in concert with the border regime and visa requirements, function as an attempt to control, as quote, an attempt to control access to the spoils of empire which are located in Britain, end quote. Al-Nani encourages us to understand that Brit the British state is actively invested in maintaining white supremacy through its laws, which create the conditions for diminished life opportunities and the diminishment of life itself for poor and black, for poor black and brown people in particular. So as nation states and institutions find themselves trying to defend their apparently diminishing resources for their dominant subjects and capital interests, the role of bureaucracy to maintain order has become pronounced. This, and this is occurring simultaneously to efforts uh, to improve and defend LGBTQI and especially trans legal inclusion and social inclusion in some forms. <clears throat> the ongoing racial and colonial ordering of Britain produces separability as essential to the functioning of the nation state. Britain does not cohere without subjecting the racialized poor, including migrants, to policing, surveillance, and terror. The political will, political will drives separability in its material manifestations of the, of the divisions of race, gender, class, caste, ability, migration status, et al. Although there are obviously complex instances whereby these di divisions do not automatically determine an outcome, such as inclusion or success of token individuals facing adversity into institutional contexts. Separability delineates political economies and effective economies of life and death, of care and organized abandonment under neoliberalism, and of frictionlessness and friction with the state and its bureaucracy, whereby the other is flagged up by the mechanics of the hostile environment. As a racial and gendered grammar, separability is essential to the functioning of racial capitalism in its current form, to stabilize its social hierarchies and divisions of labor, access and wealth historically built upon dispossession, slavery, and genocide. Separability is, is both externally imposed, e.g. by the state, although how external it is to the state is another question, uh, and reproduce, uh, reproducing pre-existing material conditions. And it is something that we also have a hand in. Our role in separability emerges as far as these material divisions and effective economies permeate into social life, that we go on about our lives amidst them, that we become a become act effectively heightened through their maneuvers, which encourage us to feel threatened by the other. The rights of marginalized people are painted as marginalizing the rights of those who already dominate the norm. And if you're gonna bring economics into it, those rights cannot be afforded even by the richest nations on the planet. <clears throat> it is in the need to confront and dismantle the permeation of separability into our social lives that brings us to practices and enactments of agency and the analysis of complicity. If separability is key to the functioning and ordering of nation states as ongoing colonial and imperial projects, then dismantling separability at a structural level and in social life too is key to decolonial practices. <clears throat> Go on to talk a little bit about inclusion and politics of rights. In the context of right-wing, neo-fascist, and ethno-nationalist political and legal ascendancy, and we're thinking about this a little bit more beyond the context of the UK, we find ourselves faced with one, neoconservative attempts to shut down the limited legal basis for individual bodily autonomy, self-expression and participation in public life, uh, for instance, through anti-trans healthcare laws and funding decisions, through bathroom bills, through attacks on equalities legislation, and two, neoliberal projects of on trans slash LGBTI inclusion through rights, which promise improve, improved bureaucracy and legal recognition and better access to public services and space for trans and non-binary people. And this is AKA known as trans liberalism. We've kind of written about this extensively before. We're trying to think about these things as a difference between like hard patriarchy, like the, in the first case, and a form of soft patriarchy. In the latter model, Inclusion promises the reduction of frictions in moving through state and institutional bureaucracy. Although in the UK context, it is, its racial and religiously coded nature is, re, is rarely questioned. If in the first of these, there is a politics of separability, 
where the bodily autonomy of trans, non-binary people and women can be sacrificed to service neoconservative nationalist society. The latter has so far failed to articulate itself beyond the logics of neoliberal multiculturalism, yet alone to meaningfully challenge the hostile environment and borders in the everyday, or to provide a reflexive analysis of the structural and institutional contexts of rights. So indeed in the UK context, the grammar of trans rights which we spend quite a lot of time unpacking how this is being used in, in our other work. Um, like we kind of give like an, <laughs> like an analysis, of like all of these different elements. Um, but it's a grammar that becomes quite quickly conflated with trans, liber with trans liberation. So sometimes rights means inclusion, sometimes it means healthcare access. Occasionally we're talking about depathologization. Um, and you know, there's questions about if we're talking about all trans people, if we're talking about minors, we're talking about incarcerated trans people. The firmly entrenched language of rights contributes to the detriment of working towards other forms of trans life, including the intellectual and creative labor of, of imagining living otherwise. Liberation can, be, can mean so much more. And, access, and actions in service of liberation do not limit to trans liberation alone. By liberation, we mean the total liberation of everyone from all forms of structural and social oppression. Thus, between the extremes of separability and the limited prospect of inclusion, we're offered a chance to rethink the politics of rights with its emphasis on individual freedom of choice and its attendant term, autonomy. Thinking through these, uh, rethinking those terms seems key to rethinking how collective movements function. A collective liberation asks for responsibility, action, and preparedness to be open to reflecting personal insights through wider relations of transformation. And in the article we offered as reading material for this talk, we discussed femme work of making groups into collectives, which includes caring for the way groups come together and act, perhaps in concert. When we think of liberation with regards to collectives, we provoke ourselves to step out of the hierarchy, fragmentation, and enforced separation that racial capitalism produces. And such a provocation is structured by the refusal of logics of accumulation and separability. <clears throat> the social hierarchies of hegemonic structures are one expression of difference as separability. Codings of gender, race, class, for instance, mark hierarchical differentiation. R.A. Judy phrases it, phrases it as follows, and I quote, differentiation implies of necessity a third point of adjudication. End quote. What Judy offers us here is that difference as differentiation as separability requires dropping an immediacy in context and relationality and bringing in a point of view from elsewhere that orders that re relationality in a new or old way. A positive homogeneity that leads with a claim that we are the same or whether we are or not is often uh, an, is an often seen attempt to circumvent such adjudication. Yet, what we learn from the Silva is that difference that abolishes or refuses the point of adjudication, whether it's epistemic, the police, or the institution, could instead be a way to come to, and I quote, a dynamism of multiple multiplicities, end quote, in Judy's expression. That means that an embrace of a variety of perspectives and solidarity without homogeneity could lead to acknowledging difference. We are not the same, without leading to separability too. We are not apart. Da Silva explains, and I quote, without separability, difference among human groups and between human and non-human entities has very limited explanatory purchase and ethical significance, end quote. From this we can learn that the politics of solidarity situates or differences in connection especially while working towards liberation as a shared endeavor. A politics of demands, for instance of rights, aimed at institutions, fragments collectives that are cut up by the lens of representation, a third point of adjudication. Taking our cue from Da Silva, we aim to understand the problem of fragmentation of collectives as a problem of ethics. We start from the problem of positionalities, the ascribed order of the social, um, which makes demands on the direction of our attention, 
which we see in effect in methods of organizing. One of the tensions we face in group work is the oscillation between holding space for agency and experience while working for solidarity in a manner that goes beyond one's direct experience without falling into managerialism. Taking over space or ignoring the plight of others in favor of so-called realistic possibilities that make it better for everyone, where everyone itself describes always a limited group. To undo some of the problems that come with this perspectival limitation, we focus on complicity over innocence and oppression. Thinking through complicity serves as a method of retaining agency while refusing oppressive structures and putting our perspective into perspective, so to say. This focus on complicity returns reflection on people's positions in structures of power to face what needs to be refused, what needs to be obstructed, and how to lay a claim to the problem that is at hand. Rather than organize our thinking according to the tools of the going order, we start by refusing some of the methods that maintain the order and embrace agency, activity, and solidarity without demanding clear and certain answers to do so. We understand that the claim for rights and inclusion is structured by an underlying claim to innocence and is as such a claim that the soft side of patriarchy mobilizes to disarm our politics. Innocence as an organizing principle in discussing oppression often relies on a desire for protection, which in turn allows turning away from the confusions of collectivity. To be good by way of innocent means not to be interrupted in one's activity that is in accordance with order. This passive form of activity relies on an overarching power, institutions or patriarchy, extending protection. In this scheme, an avoidance of violence is swapped for the extension of protection. Claiming complicity, in contrast, avoids claiming innocence and displaces one firmly outside of this empowered passivity and the structures that this protects. Claiming complicity holds space for friction between people, something that is necessary for non-hierarchical collections to function at all. A call for a refusal of power structures alone might bypass one's implication in the forms that hold the world in stasis, leave one isolated, and ignore building up the skills that movement work requires by avoiding a necessary focus on relationality. A focus on complicity does not make too much of the difference between good and bad friction, but it models and invites one to practice one's ethics for, from where one is. Reaching for collective solidarity from the space of complicity is one way to move across fragmentation towards collective action by refusing the stasis of positionality and replacing it with the practice of ethics. This proposition is an inverse of a politics of an immobilization of positionality, where positionality, or sometimes identity, seems to inform primarily how one is embedded in hegemony. Marquis Bay remarks that one's positionality might not at all be indicative of whether one is a collaborator or an accomplice working against structures of hierarchy. And I quote, the weightiness of things formerly known as identities must shift to the way one deploys itself, oneself in subversion of power and in alternative relationality, end quote. In positions of privilege, one might be, or choose not to be, aware of how one's methods adversely impact people who hold less structural power. But in positions that receive duress, this does not mean that the experience of duress translates directly into liberatory practices or relations. Bay writes, and I quote, put crassly, you can be racialized black, identify and identify as a woman or transgender or both or all three, and still do some fucked up shit, still hold steadfast <laughs> to violent norms, end quote. Intimate knowledge of the modes of hegemonic violence is not sufficient to dismantle its reproduction. Reproduction of the modes of order can obviously happen by people that are empowered, where such reproduction is part of the empowerment, but also can equally service in those that are disempowered, where aligning with hegemonic forms is either demanded or internalized. Hegemony is pernicious and spreads partly through norms of methods of relation rather than abstract categories. 
This means that formal inclusion wants to draw people in to participate and to be more like the norm. It takes a reflective step and sometimes continued support to break out of such normative patterns that have a hold on our activities. Therefore, we propose to use positionality to indicate how to investigate which refusals are needed from where one is, where is one implicated, and which ethics could counterbalance such implication. Trance, when viewed as a movement away from an assigned position, implies non-normativity as gender radicality only insofar it manifests as anti-normative actions that support abolition of hegemonic ways of being. sections titled complicity and frictions in and between collectives. <clears throat> we want to discuss how trans feminists approaches collectivity and its attendant problems. This partly means thinking about how to deal with finding oneself the problem, but without lapsing into guilt, defending ignorance, or hoping for a world in which innocence is an option. We think about complicity because we live in worlds that link into us in many ways, not all of them voluntary, consensual or desired. On the other hand, we enter into worlds that are imposed on us, such as an economically hostile environment which forces us into jobs that we might not want. In this world, we may meet demands that we display professional behavior we might not consent to. For instance, to greet all customers with courtesy and a smile while one's mistreated by their boss, or to participate in the professionalization of trans studies. Or, be instructed to align with institutional demands that we cannot always stop. So we might resist prevent screenings, which is the monitoring of radicality in Britain, or mandatory attendance monitoring for visas. Um, but okay, we, when we work on uprooting structures that enclose us in harmful ways, we need to attend to the way these structures find form within us and in our collectives. Uprooting is not only reviewing situations from a critical distance, but primarily entails and occurs through making different forms of life. Debarati Sanyal proposes to understand complicity as a, quote, structure of engagement that produces ethical and political reflection across proliferating frames of reference, end quote. With Sanyal's mention of engagement, we embrace the practice of living through complicities knowing that we are not free until we are all free. And yet, we take engagement not to mean the critical distance of supervising reason, but the practice of making new forms of living in which our senses can find grounding, but which are not forced into a single frame of knowing the world. In these forms of life otherwise, we find pleasure and joy where we meet, love, have sex, organize, and make sense of what matters. These different worlds, the hegemonic and those we fabricate with each other, are not cleanly separated, nor are the worlds we want to make ourselves free from friction. The worlds we live in are made with shared references, different viewpoints, histories, histories, experiences, and yet open to the collisions in the everyday where we rely on each other. We do not, dreams, uh, we do not dream of lives separated from the realities that form the world. In the worlds we create collectively, we might find ourselves in situations where we are part of a problem or are the problem for someone else. And sometimes we may be the problem for ourselves. While resisting imposed worlds, we may find ourselves walked over by the bravado of comrades, or we might escape into a collective in which we are enjoying ourselves, but which we hear from others uh, that the collective's unreachable and out of touch. It might be that the pleasure we find ourselves entangled in disrupt a collective. It might be that the structures we are working against are not solvable by us directly, and thus pop up in our lives and bring the problem back home. We need to think through complicity to deal with the many points of reference that we bring to the table, that we meet in our lives, and as a reminder to face what needs to be faced rather than conveniently ignored. We see collectives that aim for purity by finding the right rules or proper deference to at times abstract experiences of, of oppression as a way to cope with social complexities. 
The move towards abstractions seems to happen because we cannot share our personal experience with groups all the time. Or we cannot do so without collapsing into, collapsing into representational gestures, where our experiences stand in for the experiences of those who are deemed to fit in our category. Yet, a new norm of what constitutes a proper response or what is deemed the right response to receive duress can be alienating. For instance, because I'm trans, my experiences are perhaps about trans until it appears that they don't fit the current style of discussion and rules that aim to address duress. Organizing overtly focused on experience can collapse into a demand and obligation for giving testimony. While such testimony requires to be served up in a recognizable and prescribed format. In comparison, a more Deleuzean becoming that aims to escape from imposed identity categories might ask for a, quote, divestment of codes and significations of identity and taking on the register of the impersonal, end quote. Such a divestment, sorry, such a divestment bears the air of masculine depersonalization. In contrast, femmes are proposed to embellish and shine. But moreover, such divestment asks to relay our experiences as if they are unique or immediate, which unfortunately they are not. Social pressure is often impersonal because it is categorical. The collectivity that we crave against isolation and disposability relies on making and maintaining forms together through which we forge mutual, rec mutual recognition slash reflection, as well as holding space for differentiation. So we revert to structural analysis to shield having to demonstrate our pain as individualization of identity, which is its own soul-destroying activity. Looking at contemporary structures of institutional forms in the UK, we can see that even if the state is moving in the direction of suppression of dissent, protest, and freedom of the press, inclusion in institution does not function as a disciplinary form of patriarchy. In addition to a directly violent form of patriarchy, Françoise Vergès offers that, and I quote, heads of state have adopted a soft feminist and humanist patriarchy that contrasts sharply with the vulgar, racist, homophobic, transphobic patriarchy that boasts of grabbing women by the pussy and is contemptuous of state institution, end quote. Authority in these revamped soft institutions takes the form of fragmentation of different positions rather than grasping command of a single narrative which people are expected to adhere to. Dealing with fragmentation in practice is relegated to the shop floor. Meanwhile, management issues top-down policies that structure work. This investment in the structure of organizational forms leaves content of literature, films, and seminars open, while patriarchy retreats into a control of structure. Content remains immobilized in inflexible organizational forms. We experience how liberalism's single order works to hedge against what, from their perspective, seems to be chaos and an overwhelming variety of ways of worlding. It lays claim to solving problems by imposing policies that stifle possibilities in metrics, reinforce hierarchy, and make people individually responsible for their well-being. The aim of such politics is to create a frictionless space which is modeled on an unhindered flow of commodities and labor, replacing care for the collective with legal hierarchies. Such policies impose the translation of neoliberal market thinking directly onto social life. This means for the workplace that diversity requires accommodation while the structure of work is stripped of sociality. Outside of the workplace, a frictionless space structures sociality through money. Individual wants are accommodated by services that require no social obligation. We find that in its striving for a form of inclusion, institutions solidify methods of relating rather than police content. This disembodying and disembedding of power by investing in hierarchy is partly the cause for an obnoxious agency that plays out under the guise of individual opinions that are subject to freedom of speech. 
In recent years, the right wing claimed to be defenders of freedom constructed through a freedom of speech without accountability, while underlying, es underlining especially the exception of freedom of choice for women, trans, and non-binary people. Sayak Valencia writes, in my opinion, the prohibition of abortion in the state is a distraction, distraction tactic of patriarchal institutions represented by doctors, fathers, priests, lovers, rapists, etc., so as not to have to speak of themselves or about the ultra-violent context in which Baja California lives on a daily basis. Talking constantly about women, their bodies, their sexuality, and their choices is the best way to continue controlling us. It's a clear way to avoid the enunciation of an autonomous discourse about their own issues. As Virginie Despont says, men like to talk about women, that way they don't have to talk about themselves, end quote. <laughs> Liberals responded to this right-wing ideological onslaught by defending freedom as freedom of choice, which are always choices within the pathways offered by institutions. Liberal freedom of choice means choosing between prefigured directions which can be claimed as one's own. This is the hallmark of a possessive individualism. This false freedom is stripped of accountability in part because participants are liberated from a responsibility for structures. This form of freedom is a response to the removal of content from patriarchal organizational forms that have retreated into a background structure which is invisible from the outside. The defense of social privilege by means of aggressive statement under the guise of freedom of speech is indicative of the shift of social power. The specter of the, for instance, girl boss is an effect of the reformation of patriarchal structures to disembodied structures of control, which are presented as more objective. It bears reminding that the extreme right-wing government of the UK is reliant on brown and black politicians and politicians from refugee backgrounds to push agendas of disposability and cruelty, and simultaneously reminding voters, reading of tabloids and the Murdoch's family, other media channels, that any claims of structural oppression are signs of wokeism or identity politics. With the suggestion of managerial objectivity, partly staged by abstract moral claims, such as David Cameron's, we're all in it together, um, it is almost no surprise that aggression is channeled through a certain for freedom of speech, which has been turned into a cloaca of normative resentment. Despite its claims to objectivity, the force of policy is that it keeps collective forms in a managerial grasp. Comparable to legal discourses, policy is on one hand presented as a liberation from random acts of favoritism, yet on the other hand, the use of regulation also means the interruption of workers' power to have a say in their workplaces. This is what makes those structures patriarchal. The anxiety and anger of those still privileged within the dominant social norms is indicative of this shift from direct power to indirect support, which is with the loss of direct power simply not always understood of power, as power by those privileged. This embedding hierarchy is a problem because it ignores the friction that sociality is made of. Such friction is not solved with being right, as knowledge-driven middle-class approaches would have it but it is about the possibility of facing ourselves and each other to change how we make worlds together. We are no better than anyone. We are simply the rest. As Mariama Kaba and Kai Cheng Tom discuss, claiming complicity and participation may lead towards a set of abolitionist practices that do not rely on the victim-perpetrator schema, yet require difficult conversations. Similarly, Stefano Harney and Fred Moten proposed that embracing complicity disrupts the individuation imposed by organizations and allows a collective mode of approaching duress. Complicity in Harney and Moten's writing can take two different forms. On the one hand, it can be a complicity one experiences when one is individualized in an organization and thus faces a disrupted sociality. And on the other hand, complicity is the openness one feels in the acknowledgement that one is never sufficient by oneself. 
and that togetherness is a response against the separation by institutions because people are part of each other's lives. This kind of complicity is a refusal of being good in the eyes of the empowered. Empowered goodness means to be unthreatening and thus to effectively hinder one's own liberation. Recent union losses in the UK reflect this problem. Strikes are won by picketing and not by hoping for goodwill. Um, this is not to say that embracing complicity frees one from hegemonic social structures, but it centers a collective responsibility for the practices that are present in a group, including the responsibility to change them and thus to create friction. This spotlights another way of engaging friction rather than forms of accountability that are oftentimes individualized. The shift from individual accountability with its resonance of calculable and individualized wrongs to collective responsibility is made possible by this eager claim to complicity. Gloria Anjaldua maps out how she entered an argument at a feminist conference with all her knowledge and politics, and yet the situation shifted in such a way that she became the problem. While the problem of social tensions that have arisen in certain feminist conferences have often been discussed, Anjaldua at least has the courage to admit that she became part of the problem. From within positions of hegemonic whiteness, this step is often avoided, or it is translated directly into guilt, innocence, or self-centeredness. Reviewing our actions through complicity emphasizes entanglement and thus highlights how our actions are part of the relations that we are focusing on. To resist a certain pattern does not set us apart, but keeps us part of the situation. This means that we do not act critically and rise above a situation, but we remain present. Openness and entanglement mean that we are here, whether we want to or not. We also think through complicity to claim we are part of the problem because other people make us the problem. We carry the problem along into situations we walk into, where people scrutinize us, judge us, or feel the need to be very open to us in a way that often feels comfortable. Reflecting how we are approached and how we actively insert ourselves through feminists serves as a reminder that we are already part of the context. Problems might come along with us, either as reactions or through memory or as learned behaviors from others, popping up in other contexts, other relations, other situations. While social problems might not overpower us, they do not leave us alone. Therefore, it doesn't make sense to claim the problem is merely elsewhere and we are innocent of it. However, there's a clear difference between people who are closed out by non-normative collectives, for instance, by racism, and the hurt this caused, and the, uh, the, and the hurt this causes, and people that find themselves at the heart of the collective, and inadvertently close themselves off to certain perspectives, experiences of duress, or modes of solidarity. The claim to, complici the claim to complicity from either side of the break functions differently. Complicity in practices that make people leave invites a different manner of reflection than complicity with those same practices when one is closed out. Evoking Kai Cheng Tom, this does not mean that we side with a liberal vision which claims a truth that lies in the middle. Mm. Rather, we sit with the point that in social justice work we are collectively responsible for the ways we interact, even if it means we cannot always solve the problems directly, emerging directly in specific interactions. The hurt of being closed out by what was assumed to be a place where one could could perhaps flourish and find companionship is real after all. Collectives function differently than institutions because of the possibility of refusal and of participation, refusal of participation, which infuses a non-hierarchical element. Calls to action might hence be met with inertness. People might stop showing up or simply ignore what is said. This is not always bad. It might mean that a group is not ready to deal with the situation, or it might mean that certain approaches to organizing are not acceptable, or that people disagree on the shape of the outcome. In this way, movement work contrasts managerial hierarchies that purport to, quote, unquote, get things done. Collectives in, in collectives, when people do not show up, one should be aware that things are not going well. It might mean that one is swimming against the tide, that the conditions of solidarity need to be rearticulated. In contrast, when in, when in institutions, people do not show up to complain, 
This is taken as an indicator that things are going well, as no one has shown up to create friction to its functioning. The ways collectives come together need to be learned and rehearsed. Faced with an inability to choose existing options, this kind of freedom of liberal freedom of choice, collectives work to shape the future one wants to be in, and that others in the collective may have ideas and plans for also. Possibility or freedom of choice, such as institutions offer, is substituted by the need to create future situations, to create a new present that supports collective work. However, a common occurrence is that collectives fall apart, fallouts that can be excruciating for the, for the people involved, for those of us involved. At the same time, we can also see that this is part of the distribution of knowledge. Fallouts allow the transfer of knowledge and of methods of coming together to new groups which may combine knowledge and methods from different organizations. When collective work is compared to institutions, again, such fallouts appear to be the sign of the infeasibility of horizontal organizing rather than a sign of its success. The process of making new relations is what collectives are partly about. And in this coming together, vision is formed and ways of being together explored and grown. Creating a present in which futures can be envisioned in practice does not work in every group that comes together. Again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. neither through the overarching platform of an institution, nor through the possessive individualism of personal choice, where you get it your way, but instead as part of a collectivity, we aim to transform institutional, individualist, and possessive agency. We hold on to each other while refusing the grasp of power to emerge in collectives and social forms. This different movement that is not freedom of speech nor freedom of choice could be seen as a sort of freedom and relation. This is a liberation that is not isolated, not possessive, but perhaps marked by what Moten and Harney call indebtedness. Without each other, we wouldn't be here. By nurturing collectivities that are outside of dominant social forms, an openness can exist which does not hold relations stable. Mindful of Maria Lugoning's warnings that outside of normative collectives, non-normative collectives can relapse into policing right and wrong to control their inner workings and thus fall back on similar schemes, we look for forms that remain open. Non-normative collectives that police right and wrong push people out and demand proper behavior, seeking perhaps their own virtuousness. If instead we hold on to each other because we are here, uh, techniques can be understood as skills of relations that are not ossified in normatively proper forms of relating, but keep opening up. Transfeminism, in the way we conceive it, starts from agency. This is key because trans as a movement away from an unchosen starting point, in Susan Stryker's definition, is active before anything else. It does not start from knowledge because it is through activity that trans finds its forms. When we let the stress fall on the unchosen starting point, it emphasizes that trans is a mode of activity that is situated in the world as we find it. An agential ethics does not rely on principles, but comes with navigating one's surroundings to form and build relations, to manifest social life and to build and travel worlds. One becomes what one does. Trans navigation consists of refusal and of affirmation. Refusal and affirmation create forms of living that are shared and thus form structures of interdependency and care. This includes structuring, organizing one's attention and skills for nurturing collectives. Navigation against separability means to question in which, your direction, in which direction your attention is drawn, which methods of organizing are pushed upon you, and to know when and where one is reliant on others to fill in the blanks in sensibility but also to strengthen bonds or let forms go. Studying positionality, to return to the beginning, is relevant to indicate lacunas in relational approaches, assumptions and hidden commitments about the order of the world. An ethics which rests on the foundation of agency forms its view on accountability and responsibility from how one acts. It lies in questioning how one shows up or what one navigates, rather than asking what one is assigned. Agency and showing up structure this ethics as relational and as an ethics that happens in the world rather than individual and abstract disembedding. 
like principle-based approaches, sometimes called morality. Solidarity in this practice can entail world traveling, as Maria Lugones phrases it. You enter my worlds or our worlds or my entry into yours or to those of communities. Such acts of travel undertaken with an aptitude of openness allows us to build mutually, to build better relationships across difference which forms and phrase common interest. These acts forge space to allow us to learn together to hear or bear witness to each other's lives, forms of love and struggle. In supporting each other and studying together the extent of a problem or situation such as a form of violence or relation of violence may be recognized or revealed to some or all parties involved. World traveling as a skill that makes new form of community does not necessarily start well. But traveling worlds may be an essential act of acknowledging commonalities and particulars, of deepening empathies, empathies and acting to uproot relations of duress, both those that are external and those that we may find we have internalized. Such travel is not easy. You may learn that where you stand with your affordances actively degrades me or vice versa. In pointing where problems lie between us, we may learn together that the material securities we are encouraged to grasp at, on which we take out loans are untenable. We may articulate or acknowledge collective grievances or affects which lay bare the need for change or transformation. As our final point, we want to consider why we emphasize agency when we think about solidarity. Is solidarity not reaching out to people in situations where you might not be able to do something about? Robin Kelly, in a brilliant talk giving at LSE in London, made the argument that solidarity is working for total liberation. This means in part that one is working from the basis of where one finds themselves in the relations one is in. It means also that one questions for whom those relations keep worlds open and for whom do they close them. Complicity asks questions about entanglement and brings resistance and action against forms of organization to one's attention. Sometimes this means protesting content or the absence of it, and sometimes it means disrupting form of organization, which can take many and direct and indirect forms in itself. Solidarity starts from openness, to be curious, as Perry Zern and Arjun Shankar writes, and I quote, at its best, curiosity fuels an openness to difference and a drive towards innovation that together equip us to pursue a more intellectually vibrant and equitable world. Turn and Shankar present curiosity as counterpoint to indifference and imposition. For solidarity that rests on difference without separability, this means a vibrancy that allows one to break out a pattern of thought and feeling that keep one stuck in commitments that benefit the status quo. Actions that follow from such an openness which includes to be touched by situations of immiseration, injustice, and hierarchy break indifference. Attuning to vibrancy allows new rhythms to form in which our lives can take place. Not all actions that comprise solidarity are in relation, but some must be. Some form of redistribution of material resources, for instance, do not rely on direct relations. However, solidarity as activity towards total liberation needs collective action and thus new relationalities. We hold that these should be non-hierarchical to allow space for different focal points, different strategies, and not subsuming different struggles under a single form of action. A focus on agency and solidarity takes the pressure of a focus of knowledge, i.e. subjectivity, which in turn enables holding various perspectives, even at the same time. Shifting the primacy in approach from knowledge to action alleviates the need to have a single coherent vision on what liberation and its partner term oppression looks like. This might lead to a collective of intimacy, using Jennifer Nash's term, where different approaches that address situations of separability can come together, not limited to scholarly activity, but as active solidarity. Such active solidarity can take the form of delightful autodidactical approaches that can freely combine different sources and are not subject to disciplinary constraints and thus keep patriarchy on the back foot. A 
A solidary freed from disciplinary registers is able to cooperate across imposed boundaries and it remains solidarity as long as it aims at total liberation. Thank you.